Okay, good evening everybody. I'd like to call this uh, last meeting of 2021, the December 13th Council Agenda meeting to order. And at this time, can I call on our WeStream guy to play the national anthem. time I'll do our land acknowledgement. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations such as the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The city of Port Coburn stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. There are no proclamations this evening, Council. And if I can ask Councillor Bodner and Councillor Wells to move the agenda, are there any questions with regards to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. At this time, I do not have any disclosures of interest. Are there any further Anything further to add? Not seeing any, thank you. We have two sets of minutes, Council. Uh, items 7.1, 7.2. Regular meeting of Council, November 22nd, 2021. And the Committee of the Whole Budget, December 6, 2021. If I can have Councillors Bruno and Danch move that. Are there any questions to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. The items that have been pulled so far tonight, uh, Council, are items 9.1, 9.2, 9.4, and 9.9. .9. Are there any further items? Seeing none, uh, mover for the items not requiring separate discussion. If I can have Councillors uh, Kalalef and Bag, you move that. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. There are no presentations this evening. There are no delegations this evening. I'll go into my mayor's report. This past weekend, our city, along with most of southern Ontario, experienced a significant windstorm causing damage, down power lines, and flooding. At this time, I'd like to thank, on behalf of uh, City Council and myself, everyone for, assist, uh, for assisting during the storm, including city staff, Niagara EMS, Niagara Regional Police, Port Coburn Fire Department, and Canadian Niagara Power and Hydro One personnel. I know some people are still without power due to broken poles and down lines, and we thank you for your patience as hydro crews continue to work quickly and safely to restore power. 
This is a good reminder to everyone to be prepared for 72 hours and check in on your neighbors. And on December 4th, uh, we had our Santa Claus reverse parade. So I'd like to give another shout out to everyone who participated in the parade. This includes businesses, nonprofit and sports organizations, schools and churches. We took a different approach to try to keep our children safe and judging by the over 800 cars and just as many people walking through that turned out to view the floats lined up around HH Knoll Lakeview Park, it was a big success. Councillors um, Wells and Beauregard joined myself. Uh, Councillors uh, Councilor Wells' wife was there, my wife was there. We had our uh, Christmas card winner uh, students uh, were there also at the uh, city's uh, float. So I appreciate that, appreciate the support the council uh, gave to the, the event this year. Just a reminder that we will be closing City Hall and the Operations Centre on December the 24th at noon and reopening on Tuesday, January 4th to allow our employees time to spend with their families. We ask you to check our website for full details of hours at the Valet Health and Wellness Centre and Public Library during the week following Christmas. I want to thank the children in Port Coburn who took time to color a picture of what Christmas in Port Coburn means to them. My office received submissions from most schools and I'd like to show a brief video of the winners who also participated in the Santa Claus Parade on the city float. Video please, staff. I know the Christmas season is upon us when my office is filled with hundreds of submissions for our annual Christmas card contest. Choosing the winning drawings is one of my favorite traditions because I love seeing what Christmas is like right here in the city of Port Colburn. And I'm excited to be presenting to you today our talented Christmas card winners, ranging from grades three to seven from schools right across the city of Port Colburn. Aubrey Koros, Eli Sismar, Natalie Walker, Randall Marsh, Braden Beauchamp, and Maya Hamilton. Now let's meet our winners with their designs and perhaps one of these Christmas cards might end up in your mailbox this holiday season. So girls, thank you to Aubrey, to Ellie, and to Natalie for doing such a great job on the Mayor's Christmas cards on behalf of City Council and our staff right here in the big city of Port Coburn. We thank you and we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a joyous New Year. So on behalf of City Council and the great staff at the City of Port Colborne, we want to thank you guys for participating in our annual Mayor's Christmas Card Contest. Your drawings are fantastic and it was great to see on our float at the Christmas Parade. And on behalf of everyone, Merry Christmas and a joyous New Year. Well, today we're at a call St. Joseph. We're giving Randall Marsh his Christmas card um, in a plaque and also the, the blow up that we used during the parade this year. We thank Randall for entering the Mayor's Christmas card contest and we encourage more schools next year to be involved. And there's a bit of tradition here. Randall's grandfather, Ernest Marsh, used to have one of the best Christmas displays across the city many years ago. So the Marsh family is still involved. They still have a star on Sugarloaf Hill. And we thank Randall for doing this and we hope maybe we'll get to see him again with his great artwork for next year. And on behalf of City Council and our great city staff, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. On behalf of our staff and City Council, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Great. We thank our Communications Department for putting that together. Fantastic. And again, we thank all the kids and the schools that, that put those in. So. Um, please, again, next year, get those cards in when we ask for them, and let's get even more children involved in the community. And I was actually asked, Council, if we could do an adult side. Uh, I was asked by a few people at, at the parade and after the parade if we could do an adult art uh, work for, uh, for the city. So I'll sit down with, uh, with our senior staff, and we'll discuss that to see what we can bring out next year to see if we can get some adults in, in, involved in the Christmas spirit here across Port Colburn. So, Council, with, with regards to what was passed earlier, uh, we have unanimously supported uh, transit amalgamation for the Niagara region. And quite frankly, I think this has been 
um, a long road. Councillor Bodner can remember he was on one of the first transit committees. Then when he became mayor, I stepped forward as a city councillor at that time and, and took his position on that. And that goes back to the early uh, 20s, um, around 2005, I think, Councillor Bodner, somewhere in there. So that's how long the region's been looking at amalgamating transit. Far too long for, for, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure a number of you on council, Councillor Bruno was there at the time, uh, Councillor Demaray, Councillor Danch came in a little later, but still, this is a topic that's been ongoing. So I think it bodes well for Niagara as we move through this process to, to get on board um, and, and to support this. I think it allows us to, to bring in via rail um, into uh, uh, Lincoln and, and Grimsby area, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls. Uh, truly those are the highlights of, of, of tourism, especially Niagara Falls as we know. Really Niagara Falls is the key feature for Niagara, even though we're all involved in tourism, uh, that is a world uh, destination. So, you know, bringing true regional transit so it allow people to uh, move anywhere within Niagara. Um, it also bodes well with what this council, again, supported unanimously, unanimously within the city, which will be starting in the new year, our on-demand transit, so it covers 100% of our, our municipality as opposed to just a small urban area, and it'll allow our uh, citizens to travel anywhere in Port Coburn but also and beyond. You can go to other parts of Niagara with regards to that program. That's what Niagara Transit's going to do. It's going to allow people to come and go uh, across the region. So, you know, I do congratulate those municipalities that have supported it so far, and we ask uh, the others to please uh, follow suit and, and support this in a unanimous decision. I think it's just is, is great for Niagara. And, and I've always stated uh, since becoming mayor is the fact that whatever is good por for Port Coburn is good for Niagara and whatever is good for Niagara is good for Port Colburn. So um, with the amount of people now, and, and as Councillor Bodner, or sorry, Councillor Bruno, I apologize, uh, said to me earlier is, is you know, the, the cat's out of the bag and a lot of more people from the GTA and beyond know about Port Colburn and, and Niagara and what's going on specifically since the pandemic started. And, and I think that's just going to continue. So um, I just thought I'd throw those words out there because I think um, <laughs> this transit issue has been going on long enough and I just can't wait till it's uh, finally completed uh, at the regional level. Uh, just before I finish and take questions, pre-COVID we, we used to invite retiring staff members to council uh, to celebrate and thank them for their service to the city. Unfortunately, we've been un unable to do this in the past six months, so I'd like to take this time to publicly thank those who have retired or will retire by the end of this year. Combined ladies and gentlemen and council, combined 117 years of service to the citizens of Port Colburn. I'm just going to name those that are, are retire, have retired or are retiring. Glenn Fretz, 33 years. Claudette Lauren, 32 years. Sherry Sparks, 12 years. Jennifer Maurice, 50 years of service to Port Colburn. I was sick. Uh, sorry, I was nine when she started. <laughs> so 50 years, uh, that's a long time. And, you know, all four of these people and, and all of our staff and all of our former or all current retirees have all done their best for, for the citizens of Port Colburn. So on behalf of council, we'd like to thank them. Um, and also, one other acknowledgement, 25 years of service is Susan Therian, our Director of Library Services. Um, it was uh, in August that that came up, so 25 years for Susan. So again, Susan, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to take questions. I'm going to go to Councillor Bruno at this time. Uh, thank you, which is most of what I wanted to say about transit, but I'm really personally proud to be part of a progressive council that did this. I think it doesn't seem like a big deal today, but this is kind of history making if this goes through. And you know, to, to that end, I think it's a good deal today for Port Coburn, for jobs, for seniors, but I think it's even a better deal for our children and grandchildren. I, I look forward to the stories where somebody can stay in Port Coburn after graduating and get to the GO train in St. Catharines. Uh, and, and while they're going through school, get to a job somewhere else in the peninsula. Um, I just think it's a terrific thing. And while it's not for us to um, look at what other councils are doing for their own um, uh, particular reasons. But I sure hope that other ones that may be on the fence 
we'll take a bigger picture look at this for the long term. Um, it may cost some um, more in the short term, but I think, you know, if we're going to have go transit, I think we're obliged to do something on our end and help feed the system because because I, I worry more that the province will say, if we're not on board, why should we be investing? So um, I think it's a great day for, for Niagara, and I think it goes a long way to saying that municipalities can work together and passing this will will cool some of the jets that say nothing can get done in Niagara. Um, we don't have to be all one municipality to get things done. So uh, I sure hope uh, Mayor, you and Barb, if there's any other people on the, the fence out there and other councils can push it over the edge. But thanks for the opportunity and uh, looking forward to it in a big way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councilor Bruno. Councilor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, great day that this uh, transit has come this far. And, um, and if we can get it through, that would be wonderful. And I, and I think this is actually, we've come a long way, but it's just the start. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, something from the Environmental Advisory Committee. Uh, when they were, they sent us um, some delegation material and they're looking to the future and, and want to see this electrified and, and, you know, a bunch of other things that are available in bigger cities. So let's get going with it. Let's get it passed. And then we can move on to uh, tweaking the system and maybe even starting earlier in the morning. So kids that we hire can get to work at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Um, anyways, Looking forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Seeing none at this time, I'd like to call on Councillor Butters to give the regional report. Welcome, Barb. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Very well, thanks. Good. It's good to see you all. Um, I certainly share your enthusiasm for the Niagara Regional Transit um, amalgamation piece. Uh, long time coming. Uh, we've got over the first hurdle at the region and uh, now it'll be up to the local municipalities to get us the rest of the way over the, uh, over the finish line. So um, here's hoping that that will go smooth and we can certainly look forward to, to, to amalgamated system. I think, anyway, I think it's time. So uh, what we've been working on up at the region is, uh, lately is the levy rate. Um, it uh, has been wrestled down from 4.35 to 2.87 at the last budget meeting, um, in large part because the taxpayer relief fund is being tapped into to, to get it lowered. So instead of approximately uh, $75 per household per year increase, you're looking at more of a $40 range um, on an average house uh, household per year. So uh, this Thursday's meeting will determine that outcome. So you need to stay tuned. Uh, COVID continues to be a huge concern with uh, provinces numbers rising. So we're gonna really, I'm really gonna encourage people to be very vigilant on your own safety measures, um, hand washing and physical distancing, uh, get vaccinated if you are able to limit your gatherings to smaller sizes as recommended. Um, we aren't out of the woods yet. And now with the uh, Omicron variant, um, I really think we're, we're going to see some things change in the next few weeks. So we should be ready for that and not be shocked by it. Uh, garbage collection over the holidays. There won't be any changes to the collection schedule as Christmas and New Year's falls on a Saturday. Uh, household can place two extra bags or cans of garbage without a tag on their collection day following Christmas Day and following New Year's Day. Uh, residents in single family homes and apartments, um, six units or less, will be able to put out uh, four bags of garbage. So um, in Port Coburn, those dates 27th to the 31st is the after Christmas piece and after New Year's is January 3rd to the 7th. 
And the Christmas tree collection will run January 10th to the 14th. And those are for real trees, people, not your artificial tree that where the lights died. And I'll just end by saying, um, you know, really let's keep those um, folks in our prayers who um, were either injured in the storm or, or are still without power. Uh, help out where and when you can. That's, that's um, my message there. Uh, God bless our first responders. They did a great, they did a good job. Um, and I just want to wish you all a really Merry Christmas and a safe and happy holidays. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Council Brothers. And uh, on behalf of Council myself, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a joyous New Year. I thank see Councillor Bodner has a question. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Barb. Um, Barb, I'm just wondering if the region's going to put on any more clinics for people trying to get the third booster shot. Um, is It's hard to find an appointment in any place. Uh, I believe that's that's uh, in the works right now the, is for the boosters because I, they believe that that's really our best, um, one of our best ways um, against that Omicron variant. So I think you will see that. Okay, so how will we find out about that? Will it uh, well, probably I think that, social media? Or? Well, I think through public health, they're going to be making their, their announcements on that. So um, we, we get like a updates on um, certain Fridays of the month uh, for the COVID updates. So I, I will make sure I I will send in an email if there isn't an update coming up. I can't remember if this Friday or the following Friday. Um, but I'll make sure I ask Dr. Herji that what what will happen and how how that information will get put out there. And I'll let you know. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Council Bodner. And, and our clerk has a little bit of an update to that, uh, Barb. So I'm going to let uh, Amber come on line here. Uh, thanks to the chair. Just to add what, to what Councillor Butters said, uh, right now the focus is on pediatric vaccines. That's what has been in the system, and that's why there's been a um, shortage of appointments for boosters. Uh, but in the upcoming days, it will be more added, uh, so you should look for it later on this week. Great. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Butters? Oh, I'm good. Good. Again, thanks, Barb. Yep, you guys have a good meeting. We will. Not seeing any more questions. Great. Okay, on to uh, staff remarks. Uh, staff members, anything for council? Yeah, I'll do one. Oh, I have the CAO and then I have Mr. Bowles. I'll go with the CAO. Sure, I'll pull rank. Uh, through your worship <laughs> to council, just two things. Uh, one very quickly. I want to echo the comments of Regional Councillor Butters and Mayor Steele with respect to the city's response to the storm on Saturday and Sunday. I was in pretty constant communication with the Director of Public Works, the Fire Chief, the city's Emergency Management Coordinator, and it wasn't just first responders or, or traditional first responders in the form of fire. It was also our parks, roads, bylaw. Uh, many, many staff did a lot of work on Saturday and Sunday to keep the community safe. Um, the main event, though, I wanted to... I am sure council members have seen it in the agenda. I wanted to direct your attention to item 10.4, which is a response to a correspondence item last meeting, which was lifted and discussed. And I believe I committed at the last meeting to getting an answer for council about an accessibility issue around regional transit. We did discuss it at a CAO meeting, and I did ask the uh, regional CAO to arrange for a response, as did some of the other municipal administrators in Niagara and the response is before you uh, as item 10.4. Okay, any questions to Scott on those uh, items? Okay, Mr. Bowles, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, through yourself to council, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about transit and just to give a, a little bit of an update with the on-demand, we had the information session uh, for the public on Friday uh, there are uh, there's documents that will be sent to the houses across the, the city of Port Colburn over the next week. 
Um, special thank you to the Niagara Region and our corporate op corporate communications officer, Michelle. I think they've done a great job putting together a lot of communication material that's going to be going out over the next two weeks. And for the general public, uh, just a reminder, you'll be able to buy the passes to be able to ride on the new uh, on-demand system, either at City Hall or at uh, Valley Health and Wellness Center. And the Niagara Region will be running a little promotion for us uh, to start off where there'll be a $10 discount uh, to, to get the passes. So special thank you to the Niagara Region for uh, putting that together for us. But um, last, last point, just a reminder for those that do use the service, the service used to be Monday to Friday. And the service as you're looking into the new year is Monday to Saturday. And it goes from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. So it's, it's a much more robust service as you start planning your use in the January go forward period. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Bowles. Uh, Councilor Bonner, question to that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Brian. Um, can you confirm that uh, people that live on fire lanes have the use of this on-demand transit? Mr. Bowles? Yes, uh, through yourself to uh, the councillor and council, that's correct. Anybody within uh, the city will be able to use uh, will be able to use this uh, system. Uh, just as a reminder for council, depending on where you are and depending on the system, works a little bit um, like a crowd sourcing model. So if one or two people are in a, uh, a current location, it may identify that they're going to pick you up here and you may have to walk 50 meters or, or something like that um, unless you identify as needing uh, accessibility help in which case they'll come directly to your door for you okay all set counselor thank you great thank you further questions to mr bowles on that seeing none you're all set mr bowles yes he is any other staff have anything no clerk you don't want to do no madam clerk's fine okay on to Councillor's remarks. I'm going to start off with Councillor Clayliff. Welcome back, Councillor Clayliff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to be back. Um, it, things have gone very well, and I'm very pleased, and I, I hope I'm back. I do have further surgery to go through in January, but I'm hoping not to have to be off with that, so that's good. Anyway, thank you to everyone that um, helped while I was off, Councillor. Uh, Bagu picked up the reins and he kept me apprised of what was going on. So thank you again to him. I just want to say this evening, um, I was out and about a little bit during the storm. I tried to stay stay down because, oh, my video's off. I don't know if you can see me or not. Or am I still on? Yeah, you're still on. Okay. Um, I, I was out and about a little bit and I just want to say thank you so much to all the staff that I saw working so diligently and I saw I saw ample preparation that had been done um, getting ready for the storm and I really think they did a fabulous job and it was um, well done and I know there's still things that have to happen now but again thank you for that and I also wanted to say Merry Christmas to everybody um, I'm just kind of back and going to be off for a week or so now but anyway Merry Christmas to everyone and thank you. Thank you Councillor. Councillor Beauregard. I have no remarks at this time. Thank you. Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to uh, echo Councillor Clay's uh, remarks about staff and the work that they've done. Um, that was a, those were extraordinary circumstances and uh, our staff in, in every way, um, they just keep raving the bar and they're, they're just really quite amazing. Um, I would like to say to, uh, to everyone, residents, city staff, fellow councillors, just to, to uh, I wish you the very best holiday season. Uh, it's, it's been a tough couple of years, and I, I just hope that everybody takes the time to enjoy their family and their friends this year. Um, look at what we have and, and focus on some really positive thinking. But I do wish you all the best, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Demery. Councillor Walls. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, a couple of things. Um, th uh, through you to um, uh, Chief Lawson, if I may, please. Um, the and it's just to 
clear up some of my outstanding items that I have over the past. Uh, I was wondering if you could give me a status on the firearms discharge bylaw, uh, where that stands and whether that's going to be coming back to council soon. So um, if you may uh, give me an update. Chief Lawson. Yeah, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Wells. Uh, I believe for the most part that bylaw was passed, except for the one part about how we were going to grant exemptions to it. And council direction was that we should be able to give everybody, including uh, the applicant and anybody else, the ability to speak to that application. Right now, the manager of bylaw is working uh, diligently with staff that kind of oversee the website to be able to post the application for exemption and be able to take public consultation um, on that application so that council can make a, an educated uh, decision on that. We're hoping um, sometime in the new year, January, February, to have that system up and going on our website. And then at that time we can bring the bylaw back and brush it off and give it a number and, and put it to use. Councillor. Thanks, uh, Chief Lawson. That's, that's great. I just, uh, Sometimes uh, you, you think something's been forgotten, but uh, I know it, it hasn't, and it's just nice to re remind the public that we are still working on these things. Um, and following with that, I have um, one again through you, Mr. Mayor, through to uh, Director Kalamoto in, in regards to the site alteration uh, bylaw. I know that um, uh, uh, Director Kalamoto has picked that up, and I was just wondering if he could give us a an update on that so the public can hear where we stand in, with regards to the site alteration bylaw. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Calamuda. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor and, uh, and all Council, the site alteration bylaw is currently being worked on. We're currently out for best management practices through other municipalities. And another thing that we are doing is reaching out uh, to the region and the regional uh, local municipalities to make sure that it is consistent throughout the region as we don't want uh, any residents or developers or whomever uh, pointing fingers that they can do it in one neighboring municipality but not the other so we're just looking for consistency and we're hoping to come back to council in uh, probably late late january or late february uh, with the draft report councillor excellent thank you uh, director calamoto uh, and just to wrap up, um, I, again, I'd like to say a thank you to everybody for the storm effort that uh, was gone out. I, I did some travels uh, on the weekend on Sunday after the storm, not during the storm, and uh, there was quite a bit of damage in, in the, uh, the beachfront areas. And um, I know, and I've talked to some of the crews out there uh, that had been uh, putting in some tremendous hours and, and efforts, and everything seemed to be very well handled and managed. Um, Following from that, uh, and in hopes of uh, a, a great Christmas for everybody, I wish everybody the very merriest of, of Christmas and the, the, the best and uh, most fruitful and successful uh, New Year uh, coming. Um, and just to leave off on that, uh, just a public announcement, if I may, uh, to all of those that are interested in the beachfront end road allowance survey, that tomorrow there's a public meeting regarding that. Uh, so stay um, tune in. You can get all the information on how to log into that uh, from the uh, city website. And that's everything, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I put it in, I didn't have anything, but sitting here it reminded me of a couple of things. So uh, through you to the CAO, I know the emails were flying around a little bit earlier today regarding how many homes in the municipality are still without power. So I'm asking the CAO, can you give us an update, please? Uh, Mr. CAO. Uh, through your worship to council, to Councillor Bagu, I'm just pulling up an email that I received earlier today from Canadian Niagara Power. This was in the morning time, so I can't say for sure that it hasn't been updated with um, more promising statistics, but at the time, there were 850 Canadian Niagara Power customers uh, without power. So that is not necessarily households. That could be commercial or, or non-residential uses, but that number was 850. <laughs> the main method of communication that Canadian Niagara Power uses is Twitter on social media. 
And I can take a quick look, see on their Twitter, on my uh, on my council computer here, and see if they have updated that statistic. And maybe it might take a few minutes, so I'll let the mayor know. But as of this morning, 850. Thank you, councillor. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no need for that, Mr. CEO. Um, the 800 residents, I, I imagine that's for Dury, Ridgeway, and Park Polgren, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Bagu, that is correct. It's the entire service area, which covers both municipalities. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, my next question, I guess, to uh, to the Mister to the Mayor. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take to get power to us, the rest of the residents. Does the city allow for access to the Vale? showers for double vaccinated residents mr mayor uh if need be but i'll let the cio answer that sure through your worship to councillor baggy we have been using valley health and wellness center as a warming center as well as a place for residents to charge a cell phone or a laptop or a, a tablet computer so that they have communication available at their house and i am looking to my left at our city clerk who is the community emergency management coordinator and she is nodding her head yes when it comes to the showers and the ability to use the restrooms and so on inside the arena facility okay th thank you mr ceo thank you mr mayor and all i got left is merry christmas and a happy new year <laughs> thank, thank you, you. councillor and if anybody does call you councillor about using the showers valet just have them make sure they go through staff because they will have a male and female uh, separate areas um, based on the usage at the time. So we just don't want somebody walking in in a, in a room when they shouldn't be. So appreciate that, Councillor. Councillor Danch. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the recognition there. Uh, you know, really, uh, no complaints, no concerns. Just want to wish uh, the city and uh, all city staff a good Christmas and uh, hopefully we'll get all through this stuff real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Danch. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm just wondering on, um, I was going to ask the same question uh, that Councillor Bagu did, but I recall when CNP made either a presentation or it was a previous uh, uh, storm, not this calendar year, I believe it, um, but that they would segment those numbers to Port Colburn because really at the end of the day, it tells me their utilities out busy trying to handle 800 and some odd customers. But I don't know if that's 59 in Port Coburn and 800 in Fort Erie. So um, uh, at the time, they responded yes, that they could segment that out. And I'm just wondering through you to Mr. Louie, if um, in our updates, if you can uh, ask them to, um, to put that in perspective uh, so that we know um, what's happening in Port Coburn, um, that would be appreciated. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Director Kalamoto. Um, Director, I, I too was out um, the evening of the storm and just on the uh, east side of the canal on Welland Street, I noticed that in and around uh, Bell and Welland and uh, Alma and Welland, there was a fair bit of water on the road and some front yards on Bell and Alma. And I didn't know if that is any type, if you're aware, if that's any backflow from the canal. Was there a, a backflow valve that, that didn't uh, shut? I'm just wondering if uh, you could give me an update on that, if you're aware. And I was going to ask you one other question uh, after that. Mr. Calamuda? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. I know that uh, we do have some valves to inspect that are on there. The waves did approach over six feet uh, above uh, the average. So there might have been some uh, backing into uh, the city from, um, from the lake and also from the areas of the canal. So that, that, is, that, is, that did happen. Uh, fortunately for us, there wasn't any a large rain event. So everything that you saw was from uh, from the lake coming in. So that is, uh, but there's no, um, there's no gate, I believe that uh, that was there, but yes, the canal was backing up and creating that, uh, that flooding. 
Counselor? Thank you. Thank you. And the other one, um, Chris, and I don't know if you can get this in, in, in January, but um, you really said it all when there was no rain with this event. But are you aware of anything that with those high waves that um, water could have in, infiltrated our wastewater system? Is that something that that happens with high canal, uh, even though there was no rain this time? Mr. Calamoto? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. I haven't heard of any uh, large I and I, but what we can do is check uh, with the region. Um, again, most of that uh, I and I does come in from, well, it comes in from roof leaders, from other areas that are not connected to storm, but connected to sanitary and uh, the infiltration, which is uh, where there is the sanitary that is cracked. So yes, there is that possibility. I do know that with regard to the canal walls, there are equalization holes that do allow the water to come to the other side of the walls to equalize it so they don't fall fall in. Uh, so there is some possibility of I and I, but most of the time when we do see it, uh, it is through um, the, the rainwater, the rainwater and stormwater that collects. Great, thank you. Um, and I too, like my colleagues, would like to thank uh, staff, my fellow councillors, uh, the city of Port Colburn, everyone who's been an assistant to me and to the city. Um, wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, a couple of things this evening. Um, I wonder if uh, Steve Schapowski is with us tonight. Uh, I have a, a question on the trail brushing that was done recently where the trails meet the, um, meet the roads. And I can tell you that I've had a number of people ecstatic that this has happened. Um, <laughs> I think those that have been on council, I, I think I've been working on it since the trail was put in. And to some extent it was done, but this time it was really done. So I don't know if, if Chris, you're gonna take, I don't know whether Steve's here, but um, some of the questions I have is um, a, a great job in, in really getting them exposed, really getting the trail exposed. And, um, but I just wondered um, <laughs> when we removed all that brush, some of those old farm fences that were there, the only thing that was holding them up was the brush. <laughs> so if I was a farmer and now my field is, for lack of a better word, exposed to the anybody on an ATV or in the wintertime a, um, a snowmobile, um, have we had some kind of a game plan to... Uh, to deal with people that may own that property that now, for a good reason, we simply opened up. Mr. Kalamoto? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, if there are any areas where removing the brush uh, and force the, the fence to collapse, we will let the, the owner know. I don't think we've quite done that yet. Um, other right. than that, it is up to the uh, private property owner to install a fence uh, if they wish. What we're also going to be doing uh, just for all of council to know is we're hoping to come back uh, probably in uh, late January or February with another uh, report to council specifically with regard to the Friendship Trail crossings at uh, the rural roads and getting um, basically a standard for some of those areas uh, with wigwags without etc. And that also will discuss about um, the ATVs or uh, the snowmobiles trying to get right through uh, that area. So we will be coming back to council with those standards uh, for discussion. And sorry, what was the date of that about? Uh, uh, we're hoping to we're hoping to be in front of council at in front of council at the latest second uh, meeting in February, hopefully before. Okay. Well, I guess I'm a little disappointed in that timeline, but. Um, because we have then also opened up the ends of those trails, um, you know, to um, more ability for the ATVs and the snowmobiles to get on them in certain cases. So uh, 
I don't know if there was any um, stopgap things we were going to do. And, and maybe they aren't open as much as I think, but I think it actually did give an ability for those uh, machines to go around whatever we had put there. Um, but I guess if we're not reacting that quick, we'll just have to live with, uh, with this winter, uh, possibly having some more of those on our trails. But, uh, through the mayor, we can take a look if there are any uh, complaints that come in again, uh, for anybody that, uh, for anybody in the public that is watching, please call into the customer service and we will take a look to see if there's any uh, specific issues where that we could tackle and, and focus on those. And again, as mentioned, that we will be coming on uh, later this winter to council to talk about the overall standards and what we will be doing uh, for each of those crossings. Okay. One more, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor. Um, if, if you're looking at the 800 and some people that uh, are still without power, and that was this morning, you can take 20 off of there because Fire Lane 5 finally got power. Uh, that's why I'm here tonight, not maybe in council chambers, so I'm able to do a Zoom. Uh, and uh, in saying that, I'd just like to uh, compliment the CNP crew that did come through. They, after some long hours, I'm sure, and, um, and probably a few people upset, maybe they didn't get there quicker. They were very professional, very polite. Um, worked like crazy to get on to the next section. So kudos to them. They, they, they did a great job when they finally got to uh, our area. And I seen our crews, uh, city crews, cleaning up some trees on the rural roads. Um, they, were, they were all right at it and moving on to the next one. So thanks to them too. I did have something that really bothered me when I was talking to CNP this morning, trying to figure out, you know, are we on their list? You know, when are they going to be there? Um, and the lady I was talking to commented that they had crews on last night uh, working. Uh, I think it was seven crews, quite a, quite a bit. And they were receiving a bunch of calls that they were making too much noise. And why were they working that late? You know, that must have been from people that had a nice warm place to, uh, to stay and the lights all on. Because I can tell you, I wanted those crews to work all night long to get to everybody that needed that. So whoever was complaining about that, suck it up. This was an emergency and uh, tough if it kept you up. But anyways, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, um, <laughs> Kudos to you. <laughs> Good comment. Mr. Mayor, I wonder if I could just sidebar with uh, Councillor Wells for a second. Um, Councillor, were you going to bring up the Wildwood flooding later in the, the meeting? or? Yes, is... I was going to do that in regards to item 9.9. .9. Right, great, because I know we're both working on it, so I'll, I'll wait to, uh, <clears throat> to bring it up along with you you at that time and um i think that's about it just merry christmas and happy new year everybody have a safe holiday thank you great thank you councillor bodner so seeing no further questions uh for staff and no further staff comments we'll move on to items uh, requiring separate discussion so our first item is 9.1 bear with me i'll pull that up council So it's virtual city hall account sign-up incentive. The recommendation from staff is that corporate services department report 2021-230 be received as information. If I could have councillors Bagu and Clayliff move this. We have uh, uh, Jonathan Wright, our manager of customer service, and he's going to provide us with a presentation. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Council. Um, <clears throat> sorry if it's a little bit echoey where I am right now. I'm under reno, so bear with me. Um, I'll go through this presentation. I'm pretty excited to actually have this off the ground now. Um, it is virtual city hall. 
And um, if I can have a get Charlotte's doing the presentation for me. So if I can have you just go to the next slide for me, Charlotte. Thank you. So um, Virtual City Hall, we're just gonna do a quick little overview of it. So it'll be an introduction to what Virtual City Hall is. Um, I'll show you what the homepage looks like. And then we'll go through activating an account, making a payment online and signing up for paperless billing as well. If you can go to the next slide, Charlotte. So Virtual City Hall, what it is, it's a self-serve platform designed to assist citizens with managing and viewing their accounts with the city of Port Colborne. So um, citizens will have the ability to create a unique login account within the Virtual City Hall platform that will give them access to view their property statements, utility bills, and accounts receivable invoices. Citizens can use this platform to sign up for pre-authorized payments, paperless billing, and make credit card payments directly to their property and utility accounts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is something that um, will definitely help, especially during COVID with us being operating differently at City Hall where our doors were shut. Um, now that we have this out there, citizens can basically do most of the functions they would have done in person, they can now do it online through virtual city hall. If you can go to the next slide, please, Charlotte. So the virtual city hall homepage, it's designed to look very similar to our city's uh, web page. And that's so that we have a consistent look and feel. And that way for citizens, when they are accessing this platform, they do realize that they are going through a city platform and not some other um, third party vendor or operator to access their account information. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So activating an account, there is a video on here that we'll play in, in a moment. Um, just before we do click on that video, or if you already did, that's fine, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, when citizens go on to Virtual City Hall's platform, what they'll need with them is basically their property tax statement or uh, their water statement, because they will need to know their account number, and then the name that appears on the bill, and it will be last name, first name, so that's how our database is done, and they can activate with just having an email address and creating their own username and password. And Charlotte, if you want, you can play the video and it will show you how easy it is for someone to activate an account. Thanks, Charlotte. So as you can see, it's very, very easy for a citizen to go on. It'll probably take about 30 seconds to a minute, really, for someone to activate an account, depending on how tech savvy they are. Um, we will have staff at City Hall being able to assist citizens um, if they need help with activating their account. And they can call in to customer service or they can just visit us at City Hall um, and our greeter there will be able to assist them with activating their account. Um, Charlotte, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. So with making a payment, so this is one of the great benefits of having virtual city hall is citizens can make payments online through this platform. And this platform is directly connected to our finance software. So when they make a payment online, it actually communicates to our finance system. So we'll update their billing in real time. Um, if Charlotte, if you wanna press play and we can uh, see how a citizen will make a payment online.
Perfect. Thanks, Charlotte. So as you can see with that video there with making a payment, it's very, very simple um, to do. It is very similar to our one-time payment portal that we've launched about a month and a half ago. Um, it is the same payment portal, which is Paymantis. Um, so there is that convenience fee that is charged um, when you use a credit card um, via the website. If you want to go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So another great benefit of Virtual City Hall is signing up for paperless billing. Um, this is going to be a big push from us just for the fact that not only will it, it's a great impact for the environment for us to go paperless, but also to, um, it's a cost savings for everyone and for the citizens of Port Colburn. Um, and with paperless billing, um, you can actually click on and off. So you can turn it to be paperless or turn it to be printed. Um, and you can do that right online through Virtual City Hall and it connects to our finance system that controls our mail outs. So that way, if you're going on vacation or if you're going away and you don't want mail arriving to your home from us for your bills, you can turn it on to be paperless and then you can turn it off just by logging into your account. Um, Charlotte, if you can play the video here and I'll show you how easy it is um, for a citizen once they sign up for an account to go paperless. Thank you, Charlotte. So if you can go to the next slide, which will just cover just the highlights of this presentation. Um, and I'm open to any questions if council has any questions in regards to um, virtual city hall, but that does sum up pretty much the presentation in regards to the platform. But the big things to take away is that citizens can log in 24 hours a day, seven days a week to access their account information with the city and it's all in real time. Um, citizens can make partial payments or full payments with a credit card to their property or water statements. They can sign up for paperless billing at the click of a button. Um, they can change their mailing address and contact information that directly communicates with our finance software. And citizens can view property information and roll book information for ass assessment purposes online. And also citizens can view previous property and water statements for their account and see payments made. Um, so that sums up everything there. I'm not sure if you guys have seen some hands up for some questions. Great, thanks, Charlotte. Okay, I'm going to start with Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, uh, I just would like to say I'm so happy that this is happening. I think it's such an important thing to, to be putting forward, and I've been long, long wishing for this to happen. So this is great. Um, Unfortunately, though, those people who are dealing with the digital divide have, uh, and are, are speaking up. Uh, so I've heard from a couple of seniors today uh, with respect to the services that they're used to. They're concerned that if we go forward with, uh, with upping the, the uh, digital aspect of, of City Hall functions, that they will be locked out and they will not have access to the usual services they had. Um, I've assured them that that that's not going to happen, but I think they would like to hear city staff um, explain what services are still going to be available to them uh, so they can do all the things virtually or they can call uh, customer service and, and get it done that way. Is that correct? Jonathan? Yeah. Yes, that, that's correct. So basically virtual city hall is just another way or another platform for citizens to communicate with us um, and to make payments. We're still going to be there. Um, at City Hall for customer service and as well as our doors are open right now for, for citizens to come in. And we do have an iPad right at our front uh, greeter station that we do have set up for citizens that if they needed to use um, our iPad to log into their account if they wanted to use it that way. Um, and I, I think that um, we will be introducing the Wi-Fi at the City Hall as well for citizens to be able to access to. Councillor? Yeah. Thank you. That that is excellent. I uh, I'm mostly speaking for those people who have no interest in ever using an iPad or Wi-Fi. Uh, that that's just not what they're going to be doing. Uh, they want to talk face to face with a person or on a phone with a person. That's about as far as they're going to go. So 
as long as they know that those services are still going to be available to them, that should be fine. Yes, definitely. I can assure you, Councillor, we will never get away from live voices <laughs> again. We tried that. To be yep. quite frank, it didn't work. <laughs> And the citizens love uh, the uh, staff on the first floor, the CSRs that answer their day-to-day -day questions. So please assure all your constituents that that's, they're, there, <laughs> they're there to stay. I, I will, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And that, those are the, the, that is the reason that they spoke up. It's, uh, they've had the experience before. But I, I'm, I'm really very glad we're moving in this direction anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Excellent job as usual to you and your team. Um, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you, um, libraries are becoming more and more of an information center. A lot of people have used it during COVID and particularly with the QR codes. And I was just wondering if uh, that type of walkthrough would be available to people besides that city hall. Could it be made available at the library? Have you, have you looked at that or could you look into it as a possible second location? Jonathan? Yes, uh, through the mayor to Gary there. Um, yes, definitely. We are looking at having it basically launched in different areas. We will be moving from City Hall to the library, also to the Vale Health and Wellness Center. Um, it's just in regards to trying to schedule it with having basically someone to man those stations for a couple of days as we promote it. Um, so it will be coming in the new year. It's just in regards to just trying to get it all launched and then scheduled out. Um, for citizens to use. Councilor? Yeah, I guess I was hoping that it would just be them doing it. You wouldn't have to, you know, divide your limited staff at City Hall that, that, that they may be able to handle it like they did the uh, QR code. Um, secondly, and maybe I misunderstood the, uh, the slide of your words, you talked about shutting this off if you were the paperless, if you were away, um, that type of thing. I um, just wanted to be clear. If um, if someone joins and takes advantage of the credit to go paperless, um, there is no going back. In other words, you're you're in that system. You've got the credit. It's paperless going forward. So maybe I just misunderstood that um, shutting it down and turning it back on when you were on vacation point of view. There, there is no step back. Is that correct? Jonathan? Yes. So citizens, they still have the ability to manage their account. So if they went paperless and decided that they wanted to no longer be paperless, the, the way that that credit is designed is that they do have to stay paperless um, for a certain length of time. So I, I'm okay. pretty sure it was for a year and we do have the data to back it up. So if they go and go paperless and then remove the paperless feature, then we wouldn't be um, processing that credit through for them. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Danch. Thank you. <clears throat> you mentioned the uh, convenience fee on this, and I just wonder what the percentage rate was like for this convenience fee. Mr. Wright or Mr. Bowles? Who can answer that? Yeah, I, I can answer it. So the convenience fee is set at 2.39%. Um, and that's for your, your tax and, and your water statements. If you were to do a parking ticket, which is done through our one-time payment portal, um, that one's $1.95 per transaction. Um, there are other things that there are different rates for, but when it comes to your tax and water, it's at the 2.39%. Councillor? That's fine. I just want to make sure that people realize that, uh, you know, you, just because you're paying it online, it uh, doesn't cost you nothing. I guess if you go to Amazon, you have to pay the, uh, you know, the, the special fee to get your stuff delivered. So nothing's free. So your, your, your choice would be wiser not to have to go to City Hall and you know, bother the staff with uh, maybe they're helping those other people out. So, and uh, it's all about the convenience for the consumer. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Bruno. Um, just to be clear, that convenience fee is if you use the credit card system with Primantis, not um, payments online or direct debit from your account, correct? Jonathan? Yep. So when it comes to right now for payments online, it's only set up to be through a credit card. 
Um, if you're signed up for pre-authorized payments, that there's no fee at all to do that. That's directly connected to our finance system. But to do a payment directly, um, you can only do it right now online with a credit card. They will be introducing Interact online um, through Paymantis. That one we have secured um, a lower rate on where it's about a dollar, uh, I think a dollar ninety or a dollar ninety-five per transaction for debit. But that one hasn't been introduced yet through um, Paymantis. So currently citizens can just use uh, credit cards or Visa debit and MasterCard debit, which is basically your debit card acting as a credit card. Councillor? Thank, thank you. Great, thank you. Seeing no further questions, Jonathan, thank you. Great presentation. And uh, <laughs> I have to chuckle here because I remember the days when we used to argue with uh, Director Sinez just about getting at City Hall coming in to be able to pay with a debit card or a credit card and, and the fight back we got from staff. And here we've got staff giving us a great presentation for people to do this at home. And, and, and you know, especially if you run a business like, like Frank and I and Councillor Bodner, um, with regards to people walking into our, into our shops and, uh, you know, very few people use cash anymore. And, and even checks are, are, we're seeing a lot less checks today, but it's credit cards because they like the points. Uh, it's their debit cards, or as you stated, Jonathan, it's, it's a direct monthly payment uh, from their account to, to pay their bills. So uh, kudos to staff, and uh, it does bring back some good arguments we've had in this chamber <laughs> with regards to how uh, payments are made. So we, we really appreciate that. So again, uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. Item 9.2, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, purchasing policy that Corporate Services Department Report 2021-323 be received and that the purchasing policy attached as Appendix A of Corporate Services Department Report 2021-323 be approved. I have Councillor Wells uh, and I'm going to ask Councillor Bodner to second that. Uh, Councillor Wells is the only one that has uh, indicated he has any questions at this time. So I'm going to go right to Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, th this is a, a fairly important policy in regards to um, the spending of uh, city funds and um, authorization to do so. And I've been uh, sharing a few comments uh, back and forth with Director Bowles in regards to it. And um, I see this as a document that over time, we will have to make some changes to it. So I was wondering if Mr. Or D Director Bowles uh, has any comments in regards to how, how we can make this a, a living document so that if we run into any uh, loopholes or any areas that are not covered under the policy that we can make changes to the policy and get it corrected um, and cut off anything that uh, may not be seen as being accountable or transparent uh, in that way. So if, if uh, Director Bowles could uh, give me a little bit of idea of how we can keep this thing as a live document, that'd be great. Great. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Uh, Director Bowles? Yeah, through yourself to the Councillor and Council, uh, I think all of our policies, I, I'd argue, to some degree are, are living documents where we have the ability if something changes be able to bring it back to council or for council to ask staff to bring it back to council and make uh, adjustments at any time and uh, even on putting forward this it's great when we put it up uh, for council to review to, to look consider approving the policy uh, we have the opportunity to have those discussions and myself and councillor wells and councillor wells has provided a couple um uh, recommendations to the policy uh, to which even today staff are more than happy to uh, um, I think bring into place immediately if council uh, was uh, was willing I could actually to show I guess how living the documents are I could walk council through a couple additions that myself and Councillor Wells talked about um, through some email correspondence earlier today. Go ahead Director Bowles. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, share. 
And uh, can council see the uh, policy? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So in, in my conversations with the councillor, um, just a couple, uh, I guess, amendments to the policy uh, on this first area uh, where we're actually talking about, I'll scroll up a bit, cooperative purchasing. And cooperative purchasing is really when we're working with others uh, to, to maybe do a joint uh, purchase agreement or relying on others uh, in that cooperative purchasing. And the councillor pointed out um, the wording that was proposed was provided that such policies comply in spirit. Um, and the recommendation was perhaps it should be more uh, direct that such policies comply with the principles of this policy. And from a staff perspective, we have, um, like we think that's a, a very appropriate amendment. So we put it forward for council to, to look at uh, that amendment. Um, in addition, when we were talking about the delegation of authority within the policy, uh, through discussions, it was identified that perhaps we should add language and the language I've highlighted here. Um, I'll just remove the highlight, it might be easier to see. And that language was just that in delegating to the city's officers as employees, the CAO still retains accountability for this policy. And I think that was, um, in some respects, that might be understood within a policy that the CAO ultimately uh, oversees uh, the employees of the city and, and its policies, but embedding it is is something that is very direct and in this way staff understand where that lies and then there's two other uh, additions um, under the procurement services uh, where we talk about procurement services for employees um, there was some discussion about employees of procurement services are responsible for complying with the policies and ensure this policy and all its protocols and procedures are applied consistently and uh, through discussion, there was a desire to add are followed and applied consistently and uh, staff have no no issue with that adjustment. Those were all pretty simple. There is one administrative adjustment and I apologize if I scroll down this, it might make your eyes go because I'm going to go quickly. It's at the end. <laughs> um, on page 23, we lie, uh, we, we identify how a non-standard procurement purchase uh, process would work. And a non-standard procurement process is an issue where um, you may have a situation where you need to go to competitive tender, but you may not be able to go for some reason. And one of those reasons may be that there are no other options. There's nobody else that can do the work, or it may be that the uh, technology or the service that you desired is so specialist, there's only one person, in which case you would do a sole source. And we had some conversations internally and with our um, uh, consultants as we were putting this together. And we uh, established that we would do this um, at the open uh, competition thresholds. And that's the threshold to which we would go out to competitive tender. And to that point, if there was anything that we had to sole source above the tender limit, so for goods and services, that would be $100,000, then we would uh, come back to council and ask council for approval for that, um, that sole sourcing situation. Now we updated this page on page 23 and it was a clerical error and I apologize for scrolling you all the way down. I just want council to understand the changes. Um, there is additional protocol information about non-standard procurement at the back end, but that was not updated. And it was actually left at an earlier recommendation to put it at 1 million. And from staff perspective, we didn't think that was appropriate. So that's where we had reduced it to the open competition threshold, which brings it down to $100,000 for goods and services. Um, and that language there was not removed. So we have removed it. So when you, uh, if council was to approve the report, um, we would approving, you'd be approving this amended, these amendments to the appendix, and I'll have to ask the clerk how, how that works um, with respect to if we have to adjust the motion, but that would be the, these would be the adjustments that we talked about today. And from staff perspective, we'd have no issue with, uh, with amending for these adjustments. I'll stop sharing my screen and I can share it again if council needs it. 
Great, thanks. So with regards to that, we, we don't need to amend it at this time. It'll actually be amended under the bylaw section so we can approve what you've discussed here and what we have within our report and the bylaw itself will be done as amended. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, uh, my uh, compliments out to to Director Bowles and his team for putting together a great uh, policy that uh, will really help us as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you for bringing those uh, forward and discussing that with, Council or with Director Bowles. Um, as you've stated, I mean, I, th I think this, as we go through our budgets and we've approved budgets, this just allows staff to get things done faster. Um, get them to pro uh, projects on the on the on the on the go faster and shovels in the ground and so on and so forth. So I, I, again, I'm just like you, Councillor Wells, accolades to uh, to Mr. Bowles and his staff for, for bringing this forward. So uh, seeing no further questions, it has been duly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, Council. Again, done unanimously. Item nine point four. My Main Street Local Business Accelerator Program, recommendation that Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-314 be received, that Council approve the funding agreement with the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, FedDev Ontario, for the My Main Street Local Business Accelerator Program, attached as Appendix A to Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-314, and that a bylaw to enter into agreement with FedDev Ontario be brought forward. I have Councillor Danch, and if I can ask Councillor Bruno to second that. Councillor Danch was the only one that uh, wanted to ask a question. Go ahead, Councillor Danch. Uh, thanks, for, for, thanks for that. Um, I had a, a super conversation with Bram this afternoon on uh, all this, and I, I really just want to make a, a point of bringing up the fact that uh, you know, it may be my main street, but it's, you know, it's, it's everybody in business and it's uptown, downtown kind of thing. But, uh, me and, uh, you know, oh, there you are, Bram. I see you now. I just want you to maybe go over some of the topics that we, uh, talked about today and, and make sure the merchants understand what's available to them and, uh, you know, what a good idea this is for all of them. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Cotton, go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Dan, for the opportunity, uh, and to all of Council and to those watching. Uh, My Main Street is a is a collaborative program between the Economic Development Council of Ontario and the Urban Institute, it's funded through the uh, federal government. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to um, have a staff member paid for by this program to work in the economic department, economic development department for the next year. Uh, they will be going out to local businesses. Um, having discussions about um, what uh, what we at the city can do to support them at the same time as informing them and marketing our CIP program. Um, and also an amendment to this or a, an augmentation to this program is that the um, city of Port Colborne will be eligible for up to $100,000 in funding uh, to support 10 grants of $10,000 to support local business expansion uh, and or creation. Um, so we'll be able to, to work with local businesses on some expansion plans and uh, some opportunity for some new businesses to start and, and receive the grant. Um, it's not just, it's called My Main Street, that's the name of the program, but it is my it is Main Street downtown. It's, across, it's citywide from our perspective. Um, we are one of 65 uh, cities in the province or cities slash uh, BIAs, not-for-profits, uh, eligible recipients that will be receiving funds. So uh, it, it's an excellent opportunity for us to, um, to, to add to our staff complement for the year and to support our local businesses and help them to, uh, to grow and thrive. Great. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Councillor Danch. No, thanks so much, Bram Hitter on the head. Uh, it's all about uh, being in business and... Uh, it's always, you know, everybody thinks being in business is wonderful and good and uh, more days than not it is, but there are those days that are super, super trying and, uh, you know, any help is certainly appreciated and thanks, Bram, for all your help. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggett. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Bram, you mentioned 10 businesses. Now, how would these 10 businesses be selected? Mr. Cotton? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Begue. So there will be an application program. Um, we're just waiting on some of the final details from my main street. Um, then we'll be able, we'll be um, promoting it through our social media channels, through our website, through this activator that will be going down and speaking to local businesses. So I, I apologize, I don't have all the details on the 10 grants that we will have. We'll have more information on that in the, in the new year. Um, and it also actually, this program also provides us and pays for us to get um, uh, demographic information from, from some experts and there's a, a laundry list of uh, services that we at the Economic Development Department will benefit from and that we'll be able to uh, work with local businesses on as well. But to your question, Councillor Begue, the details will be forthcoming early in the new year. Councillor? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Bram. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further questions, Bram, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Again, unanimous. Thank you, Council. Item 9.9. .9. Municipal Climate Resiliency Grant and Home Flood Protection Program. Recommendation that Public Works Department Report 2021-316 be received. That Council approve applying for the Municipal Climate Resiliency Grant and that the manager of water wastewater be directed if funding is received to enter into an agreement with AET Group Inc. to administer a home flood protection program for up to 50 homes in Port Colborne. Uh, I'm going to have Councillor Wells and Councillor um, Bodner move that since they already spoke with regards to this coming up. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there are a couple of things uh, that I have in regards to this. And I can pose the question to um, uh, Darlene in regards to um, the perception that I had after reading the report was that consideration was going to be given for homes that were connected up to uh, the city's uh, uh, sewer system in regards to backflow uh, preventers and, and things like that. Uh, however, as we've noticed uh, through the weather events that we've had, um, the flooding does not just occur within the urban area. In fact, there are some of the rural areas that uh, experience the, the worst flooding I've ever seen in my life here in Port Coburn. Um, with the water levels in, in the lake rising, uh, with the inability to be able to stop those waters, uh, there's a lot of rural areas that are on watersheds. Um, that are being flooded. And, and one of those uh, that we experienced this week and uh, which was significant was the Wildwood uh, area. Um, these were full-time homes that were completely underwater, not just a flooded basement, but the, the water was actually up to the door sills uh, in the main floors. Um, and it was extensive on, on a lot of those areas. And the water was still there um, days later. Uh, today, I, in fact, it was still there. Um, so my question to Darlene um, is that, can, we, um, uh, can it be applied to homes other than just urban homes? Can, we, can this program be applied to rural homes? And, and um, is $500 sort of the limit on, on what would be expected? Because as we all know, $500 won't go very far when you're trying to waterproof a, a basement from a flood uh, uh, coming in on you. So if, if Darnine, can you give us a little bit of background on where we can, if we can put the, uh, apply this to rural areas? Ms. Sutter? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Wells. Um, absolutely, we could, um, I, I reached out to the company that does the home, home flood protection uh, program and they definitely can offer in rural areas. Uh, the cost of the assessment is around $500 uh, per home. So that is the, the $500 um, that goes for the actual assessment. Um, as for the grant, uh, that was our suggestion to, um, uh, to do the recommended upgrades to a maximum of $500 per home in order to try and spread it out. Um, because the, the maximum total grant is $100,000 and they do also cover backwater valves, which yes, applies to your, your um, 
urban homes that are attached to the sewer system. And we thought because of the July 17th storm event, because we have had a lot of storm events, um, that we would offer the uh, backwater valves, um, the $500 subsidy for the backwater valves. So that could be adjusted. I'm sure we could, um, when we do the application, uh, if council approves it this evening, we could definitely adjust the amount that we wanted to offer through the grant. Um, I don't believe there is a maximum uh, that we would offer the grant for actual repairs, um, just that it is used to do uh, recommendations from the um, home, flood, home flood protection assessment. The actually in looking at the documentation, I'm remembering um, the they did say in the studies they've done that uh, you can have repairs going from $500 to $10,000. So I guess it's where we want to stop. And you know, do we want to try and do 100 homes at $500 a home, or do we want to try and do you know five homes at $10,000 a home? So it's basically what we would like to offer in order to try and get the best bang for a buck and spread it around. Councillor? Thank you, Darlene. Um, uh, with that, then I would uh, like to request that um, if we do have success in receiving the funding from this, that we do include uh, some rural properties within our consideration for the assessment as, as well as uh, for consideration on applications for grant uh, funds on that there. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. And then just to follow up with that, um, because we are seeing some issues that uh, we have not seen in Port Coburn or in, in Lakefronts, um, and one could assume that they are associated to climate change. Uh, um, I would. Uh, I was wondering if, um, and I know. Um, our superintendent of the drains use was on the on the call, but I don't know if she's still um, connected. But if uh, Director Kalamoto has any information in regards to um, what uh, uh, what measures we can do uh, can put in place within the drains, or if there's being considered alternative measures within the drains to protect uh, watershed areas from these um, high rising water levels uh, that have. Um, that I would associate to uh, warmer climates, uh, uh, temperature changes, climate changes, and uh, a potential thing that will get worse in the future. Mr. Kalamoto? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, maybe I'll give a little bit of an answer and then turn it off, turn it over to uh, Mendra Sutter. But as we were going through uh, the engineer's reports for new municipal drains, we were actually moving from a one to two year, one and two year storm to actually a one in five year storm noting that uh, those also grow. And as the province takes a look at our, um, what we call the I-curve, uh, I guess for, for those of us in, in engineering, taking a look at the intensity of the different areas, the province is actually re-looking at those curves. So what it actually means is a redefinition of what a one in two and a one in five and et cetera storm actually means. So as uh, new engineering is done within those municipal drains, we are going to be relying on more up-to-date information and actually preparing that infrastructure for larger storms. I'm not sure if uh, Manager Sutter has anything else to add on that one. Ms. Sutter? For sure, yeah, thank you, uh, um, Director Kalamuchu. Yeah, uh, in speaking with the drainage superintendent earlier, we did speak about the burst drain and the problem we have with this drain is that there is no outlet structure. It, it, it relies on the protection of the dunes uh, to prevent the water from backing up from the lake. Uh, there was three meter, uh, the lake was up to three meters during this storm. So unfortunately, it's just not designed for that. All of the, the drains actually, uh, the, the, even the ones that do have outlet structures, the gates were down, they were functioning, they were in place, but the water was just coming up over the gates. It was coming up over the banks. It was just, it was, it was a SASH event and it just, nothing is designed for that currently. Um, that's definitely something, you know, moving forward in the future, as, as uh, Director Kalamuju indicated, you know, as the drain reports come forward, they're going to probably revise the, um, how they're assessing it. But again, it all comes down to money as well, unfortunately. Um, you know, municipal drains are not funded through the tax levy. They're funded by the residents on it. 
And, you know, some suggestions may come forward on how to protect the outlet, but it's whether the, um, the people in the, in the drain are able to handle that expense as well. My understanding is the burst drain is six meters wide and trying to put something in there would probably be very, very costly. Um, and we're not even sure how it would, you know, how it would happen. Not to say we're not going to have potential solutions in the future uh, that would come to us, but it, 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 it was a very, as you mentioned, extreme weather event. And I think definitely, and the drainage act is very old as well. Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, Darlene. There, there was one thing and you brought up the bears drain and may, maybe uh, Councillor Bodner will elaborate on this too, but the bears drain is fairly unique in that it has uh, um, some valves that were installed, which were backflow valves. Uh, to hold the water back, <laughs> actually, um, to help with the spawning of the fish and everything else in that area. Um, is, is there a potential to maybe modify those so that the water can move back out as quickly as it comes back in? Ms. Sutter? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Wells. I can speak with our drainage superintendent. Um, I know we were, I was reviewing the report earlier and those uh, drain, those valves were installed to prevent the water from the side drains that empty into the burst drain from uh, backing up. So if, if the burst drain overflows its banks or, over, or goes up high, it doesn't back up into the local drains. Um, that is what they were installed for. And whether, you know, we can look at something else. I know they looked at a number of alternatives when they did the engineer's report in 96, uh, but that doesn't mean the technology hasn't changed. But I do know uh, in speaking with the drainage superintendent, it may require uh, a report to be opened at some point. So definitely I can speak with her and see if there's any alternatives that we can do without having to reopen the report. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Darlene. Great, thank you. And just for information, there is a program coming forward through the federal government under environmental protection, shoreline protection, uh, Great Lakes cleanup. There's a, a number of uh, items within that uh, that we can look for funding for. So it's projects that we can look at where we can partner with, with uh, local landowners, uh, the NPCA, the Niagara region, Niagara Health. Um, we have been discussing uh, the, the, the Lakeview Park area with regards to the hospital and Northland Point. Um, with the flooding that's going on there. So a project that uh, the four organizations have been discussing to, to do something here to help mitigate that. So there is money coming forward. Um, uh, uh, MP Badaway does keep uh, senior staff in my office in tune with as those things are released. So we, we can discuss that with, uh, with the MP with regards to what funding is available, the type of dollars, the type of projects that... that um, Things that we're looking at, Councillor Wells can fall under. So I appreciate you bringing those questions forward. Uh, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think uh, as far as the drain goes, I've heard pretty much what my questions were uh, that Harry asked. Um, but um, we really do need to look at, at a funding source. Um, to, to help alleviate this, it, it, was, it was major. The only time I've seen water, it was just slightly higher than that. And if Councillor Butters is still on the line, I think it was in the 80s when it really um, actually engulfed some more homes that then were engulfed this time. But um, it, it was really bad out there. And if you own one of those homes, you, you're in tough shape. It's like Councillor Wells said, that water's still there now so um it's not good um through you mr mayor to darlene um on this um report that came through about installing uh the backwater valves uh, how do we how do we pick the 50 homeowners that or it may be less if we get some rural ones in there but how do we pick the the homes that would take advantage of this is there a means test huh? like is it geared to income for one thing Ms. Sutter through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bodner um currently we were planning on opening it up like I said to residents that were affected we could definitely say it, like with the uh, July 17th storm that had a uh, backflow and then we were going to open it up to the city wide so some of the backflow valves will be potentially suggested as part of the home flood protection assessment 
if someone in the in the urban area has that done and they say, yep, you need a new backflow valve, um, they'd be eligible to put $500 towards the backwater valve and an additional $500 for an additional assessment um, or for additional items that were um, brought up during the assessment. And then we were going to open it up for an additional 50 backwater valves because we know um, sewer backups are very costly and to any resident. And we weren't going to do it at a test. It was going to be they'd pay for it, submit their receipts, and then they'd get the fifth, they get the five hundred dollars back based on the receipts that they put out. Councillor, okay. <laughs> I, I guess I have a problem with something being able to afford this, anyways. And quite frankly, if my basin was flooding, I'd be putting one of those valves in, no matter if there was a grant program or not. Um, I just don't know whether. I just hate to see people get that money that really can afford to do it and maybe somebody else down the line that can't afford to do it. I know we're talking about a specific area that really is is prone to this, but um, I guess I'm surprised that their insurance company doesn't say you have to put one in no matter what, but I'll leave it like that for more discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Bruno. Um, Thank you, Worship. Just following on that uh, trail um, through to Manager Sutter. Um, I like the mimicking of um, what we're doing with uh, laterals, where we have uh, an area that's defined already that's uh, clearly had problems, and they have an opportunity to go first. So just back to that, from a practical point of view, so I'm, um, I'm sure... Um, uh, Councillor Desmarie may be thinking of Clark Street in Wellington. I'm thinking of Bartok um, in that area. So now we have people who, who've, uh, uh, I'll use Bartok as an example, is near and dear to my heart, and Frank's. Um, you know, they've been there 30 years. They've had four floods. Their current backflow valve is expiring or let loose. Do we need to spend $500 on an assessment in a proven flood area? to give them money, to give them $500, it costs us $500 that they have to get an assessment, when in that case, it, from a practical point of view, it's pretty clear that 500 for the assessment could buy another backflow valve. And so uh, I guess I'm concerned that we could get more bang for the buck if we already have identified places. And I don't know if you have the latitude to re- parlay that money? That's my first question, darling. Yeah, through Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, to Councillor Bruno, the uh, the uh, the there was the fifty homeowners would get uh, would be assessments. Fifty could, could potentially qualify for backflow valves. Fifty for five hundred up to five hundred dollars in retrofits that are recommended as a home flood protection program. Then an additional fifty backwater valves for anywhere in the city without going through the the assessment. So uh, for so our friends, our, our residents on Bartok, absolutely, they would not have to do the assessment if they didn't want to. They could just apply for the backwater valves. Great, thank you. Second question on that, Darlene. Well, just before you um, go on, Councillor Bruno, uh, sure. Mr. Calabuto, I think, wants to step in on this one. Chris? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the Councillor and, and all of Council with respect to this. This, uh, this funding that uh, the manager has put forward is also to subsidize some additional homes and some additional audits above and beyond what council has just passed with regard to our water and wastewater rates. So there is actually a one, two and three punch that staff are putting forward uh, with this. Again, focusing on where we know, where staff know to be uh, problem areas with regard to stormwater control that actually leads into um, sanitary control and I and I and then ultimately in the rural areas, the, the one-off um, uh, homes with regard to larger properties. So we are taking a look at uh, sort of all sides of the area, focusing where the low hanging fruit is, where we could get the best bang for the buck. And then if those funds uh, don't get absorbed with that, it's putting it out to uh, the other, other areas, rural areas included in that, uh, so that we can then, um, maybe uh, have that money go into, into other areas of town. But, but at the beginning, we're just focusing on the low hanging fruit, the low areas, 
again, uh, there is uh, other money available. And because of that, because it's uh, three di different directions, you don't necessarily need to have that audit done by, uh, in this particular case, by the, the report that's talking about with intact insurance. You don't necessarily need to do that to just change out the backwater valves. That can be done uh, through what council just passed in the in the water and wastewater rates now that we have that program also. So with this, again, like I mentioned, there are multiple areas where multiple residents uh, can help with, uh, that we can help uh, as, as the city, as staff and council to help many different residents in different ways. So I just wanted to point that out. It, it wasn't just, it's not just a one-off with regard to this project, it is also what council has just passed in the budget and collectively it becomes a, a larger program. Councilor Bruno. Thank you, three to darling. If the, uh, particularly now with adding um, some rural areas. So if we have proven areas that need, in this case, the black backflow preventer and you have the program of 50-50 existing area and new, um, I, I guess I would, my concern would be that the area we already know is prone. It's already had floods. It's already had insurance claims or insurance claims denied. Could be then oversubscribed to the 50. Um, in the program with that Chris just talked about on water and wastewater, there was language in there that said basically kind of we're going to not let that happen that, that that we're going to cover that i i'm very clear that this is a grant and from uh, a government agency and is not uh using i believe city funds at this so I, I guess i would like to put forward that if you have a proven area with proven floods and there's 62 of them i'd like to see that access at least guaranteed to go to the proven flood areas and by virtue of that you know only 38 go out to new uh that need an assessment again would you have that latitude and in the spirit of this program without rewriting rewriting the bio or the, the the grant um are you willing to do that and maybe that's to um, mr kalamoto as well because my, that's my biggest concern that that what we know gets oversubscribed. oversubscribed. I mean, 50 is a small number, and at only $500, at least to get the most bang for the buck. Notwithstanding, those other 32 or 50 may well need it in the Sutter? future. Yeah, through Mr. Mayor to, to Councilor Bruno, uh, we I don't I don't believe that every home that has an assessment will require a backwater valve. Um, it, they may, which is why we put in the 50, but I think that if, if the 50 homes that are, that come up with the assessment, uh -huh. if they have other things to do around their properties that excluding a backwater valve, then that's where they would get, they would use that part of the grant. I don't believe based on the criteria that we would be tied to exactly what proposed. Okay. Um, my understanding is it's the hundred thousand dollars and it, it would be up to us on how to allocate that our program within that hundred thousand dollars. So I believe we would have the flexibility to kind of move it around and make sure that uh, we get uh, as much bang for the buck as we can with the hundred thousand. Great. So do you need any direction from this council if I wanted to ensure that those in assessed areas um, that are first in your current plan, but only limited at 50, if it goes to 60, do you need this council to put forward a direction that they um, still are a priority if they exceed the, the 50. Ms. Sutter? Good question. I don't think so because I think we do have that flexibility at, um, with the application when we say, you know, this is what we want to do with it, if we get the $100,000. And I think it's just up to us to shuffle it where we need to. That's what I'm guessing. I'm just thinking you have it in two tranches, but it, you also have it in two application periods. So if the first application period expired and there was 52, you could deal with that. If there was 48, then, then we don't have anything to talk about. So I, I guess I'd like, like to see that flexibility. And if so, I'm fine with this. 
Great idea, great program. Hope we get it well needed. Kudos for applying. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clayla. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to, um, I think this is to the manager. Dorley, do you, um, I've had some calls from some people uh, along the lake shore out on, on, on Tennessee and up behind the hospital, just at the edge of the hospital. There was, you know, this was a major water event. Um, you know, I don't, the drains, they were concerned that the drains were coming back onto the properties and that, but I think that the, from what I saw, it, the, the, the wave action was so much. I'm just, can you explain a little bit and clarify um, when it's private property like that and there is this type of wave action, I don't, the, the city is not bound to be doing anything as far as that goes. Do we have any responsibility there, Mr. Kalamudu, as far as anything that we could do to help them or work with them to improve the, this type of event, which is happening more and more? Mr. Kalamudu? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the council and all of councils, as we see a climate change ravage our lakefront cities. Unfortunately, sometimes there is not nothing that we can we can actually do, especially with regard to our limitations economically um, and and time wise. Also, we do have to adapt. And as mentioned before, uh, I believe to Councillor Wells, as we look into things and re-engineer things to the new normal, that is things that those are things that we do take into consideration. And as we move forward and engineer things like our drains, we just ensure that we move to that, uh, that new normal and get that understanding. Now, as, as it comes to, to private property and what our infrastructure does, if it meets the need at that time, no, there is no real responsibility because it was put in in good faith to the uh, information and the best engineering at the time. Uh, it would be different if there was um, any malice or incontent or other things such as that when that infrastructure was was gone in but i've never actually uh, seen that or witnessed that now it, again as um as we as we build things we we often build to take things to the lake and the drainage away from properties to the lake unfortunately when we have its incidences that occurred on saturday the lake actually comes onto land so it actually works, nature is working in the opposite direction of how infrastructure is engineered and how it works. So in, in those cases, there's very little that we can do, especially when uh, infrastructure is put in so long ago, mm -hmm. and especially on private property. As we, again, as we move forward, we could take a look at uh, other options of engineering to, to then try to minimize that uh, when it comes in, to the public realm. So that is where, where we would do it. But if there, we would not be doing any works on private property. But again, as we do that to, uh, to public property and re-engineer the pipes, it will eventually trickle down and uh, minimize issues onto private property. But again, that's with time, uh, that's with dollars, and it will take, uh, take a long time and a lot of dollars to ensure that we, we keep battling this climate change. And we are, as, as staff, always looking at uh, opportunities when we do put in uh, new infrastructure to minimize this disruption, not just to public uh, land, but also to private property, if we can affect that. Councillor? Thank you very much. So if, if they wanted to consult with staff on anything that they might be able to do or any ways they, they could actually, things they might need to do to actually improve their properties, I, I'm assuming that we'd be more than willing to, to work towards that with them or help them. Would that be fair enough to say? If there are things that are uh, on, on public property that they may need to do, that is definitely something that uh, staff would take a look into, whether it be uh, municipal consent that is required, um, whether it be an encroachment that is required, absolutely, that's something that uh, that staff can do. If it is just on uh, private property and the work is to be done just on private property, then there is a, a different system. We wouldn't come up with, uh, with solutions. What it would be done is something that would be submitted through, say, the building or planning department mm -hmm. and not really looking at the engineering of that because it would be on private property. All right. So it's fair enough to say, you know, when I, when I was down there looking at it, 
And I'm and I like you said the same thing. It wasn't the drains going to the lake. It was actually the lake going to the drains. It's how it appeared to me. And I don't know anything about engineering. And yet that's what it looked like. So you know the water was so high. So anyway, thank you for that clarification. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to uh, Darlene. Darlene, uh, just further to Councillor Bruno's uh, uh, concerns and the uh, targeted areas that, that we had been speaking about earlier. Councillor Bruno will always be thinking Bartok and I will always be thinking Humboldt. Um, what would be the uh, areas in the city that you would consider um, that should have a higher priority? Ms. Sutter? So those listening can, can know. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demaray. Uh, definitely the July 17th storm event is the one that we were thinking of those areas. Uh, definitely the Janet, Clark, Humboldt, uh, Wellington area would definitely be one. They actually experienced the most flooding out of all the areas in the city in July 17th. Um, actually, Janet Street had the most number of homes um, and also the Bartok area. So basically those would be the, the areas we would focus on uh, to offer the, um, the assessment and definitely the rural areas that were affected as well would be one of the ones. But the, the back, backwater valves, that would be where we, what we suggest as well because a lot of people there had sewage back up into their basements. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure that those people will be very happy to be watching this council meeting. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Councillor. You're correct on that. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one quick question, uh, either to um, uh, the acting director for planning uh, or to director of public works, whoever can answer it the best. Um, seeing that we're experiencing more and more of this happening, is there, um, a manda uh, is there consideration for a mandatory inclusion within the building um, permits for a back uh, a sewer back uh, water valve. Mr. Kalamuda. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, and uh, maybe I would turn it over to Manager Sutter after this. But <clears throat> that that is something that is being uh, looked at. It is not mandatory right now within the system. But again, as climate change changes all of our perception. Um, you know, I, um, in Barry, as an example, the tornado go went through and the Ontario Building Code is taking a look at putting additional nails and roofs. As we have uh, climate change in the water uh, area and the downpours that we have and the INI that is in every single municipality, that is something that I know is being considered um, by the Ontario Building Codes and those that are, that are taking a look into it. So um, if I can answer for the acting director, I know that it, uh, of planning, uh, I know that it is definitely something that we look at, at among other things as climate impacts our infrastructure and our living. So it is, uh, it is on the radar. And it is something that has been available uh, for a number of years. And I know uh, from personal experience that if you do put in something like a back water valve on the sanitary side, you may even have your insurance reduced if you let your insurance company know. But uh, as this report is indicating, the insurance company themselves are now introducing these methodologies, these ways, these technologies, and these audits to try to identify things like backwater valves that are so important uh, that would help protect both property and people. So, uh, so that's a long answer to a yes, kind of. Um, but maybe for more information, I'll turn it over to the manager. Ms. Sutter? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I don't have a whole lot to offer that actually, but yeah, it would be nice to see things like that become mandatory. Um, I know the building code has things like uh, backflow prevention to protect the drinking water mandatory on certain applications now. So it would be nice to see the building code recognized. The challenge we have as a municipality is we don't control private side. And, you know, it, we, we can't, unless the building code says thou shalt, we can't say thou shalt on, on, on some things like this. So um, it would be nice in future to have the, uh, the building code support this as well. Yeah, because since the 80s, the, a new build has to have a backflow valve on the sewer line. That's been there. Any brand new house in Port Colvin, whether you're in Ward 4 uh, without sewers or in the urban area with sewers, you have to have that backflow valve and the 
CAO just looked it up and it said, you shall. <laughs> so, uh, but I believe it was in the late 80s that came into being uh, with that. And, and I think the CAO made a good point to Councillor Wells' question is the fact that when somebody's doing new work on a pre-80s uh, build, should the building code state that they actually install uh, a new backflow valve if they're doing work on that sewer line? But good question. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. There are no motions this evening. Does any Councillor have any notices of motion? Okay, seeing none, we have no minutes of boards or committees. Bylaws. So under the bylaws, I'm going to have Councillor Demery and Councillor Beauregard move bylaw 21 1. And remember, Council, um, we're approving the 21 1 with the amendments that Mr. Bowles brought forward. Uh, bylaw 21.2, 21.3, and 21.4. Any questions on any of those bylaws? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. So we do have an agenda in the confidential in-camera meeting. Does any councillor wish to go into camera? To go in camera to, to deal with the report or do you want to pass the recommendations here? Okay. We don't need to go into camera. So council, we have two items uh, with regards to in-camera. The minutes of the closed session portion of the November 22nd, 2021 Council meeting, uh, which is item 22.1. And item 22.2 is Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-322 concerning 235-241 Welland Street, pursuant to Municipal Act 2001, subsections 2392C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board that we will be approving the staff recommendation within the report. Uh, if I could have two councillors move that, Councillor Bagu, Councillor Beauregard. Um, Madam Clerk, I can take questions at this time. As long as it's not the details. As long as it's not details of what would we be in camera. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Please raise your hand. Opposed? That's carried. Thank you, Council. Perfect. There are no procedural motions. There are no information items. Before we adjourn, uh, based on what uh, all of our councillors have stated, on behalf of myself and my family, we wish everyone in Port Colborne and in Niagara a very Merry Christmas. And, a, and hopefully a prosperous new year. And as we move into 2022, we look for bigger and better things, both here in the city of Port Colborne and throughout the regional municipality of Niagara. Council, I'm sure we'll see each other, but uh, for those that I won't see, please have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And at this time, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>